each week as we start this series on the Apostles' Creed, uh, we are going to uh, read the creed together. Um, for those of you that grew up, thank you, Kai, those of you that grew up in a liturgical church, or that's the norm for you, you're like, this is norm, this is the, the norm. For those that were like mainline evangelical, we like our chairs and we don't like to get out of them. Uh, but this morning, uh, as we start this, would you do me a favor? Uh, would you stand as we read uh, the creed together, the Apostles' Creed? Uh, we're going to explain what this is here in a moment, um, but we're going to read it together um, for the most of us. Uh, so let's say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Man, you did it. You did it. You can be seated. That's a beautiful sound, isn't it? Declaring the, the goodness and the, 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 the doctrines and the, the thoughts of who God is and what we believe about him together as a church family um, as we've done that. Um, I want to give a disclaimer here as we start this off because some of you uh, probably were reading that. If this is your first time to go through the Apostles' Creed and you're thinking like, well, I didn't know that we were a Catholic church because we don't do anything like the Catholic church. Um, if you notice in that, that doesn't mean the, the Roman Catholic church, okay? Uh, if you notice in the creed, it, it has a lowercase c. Uh, what that really comes from a Greek word um, uh, that where we get the word Catholic from. And it, really what it means is the global church, the capital C church. Okay, so that's usually a sticking point for many people when they hear the Catholic Church. They're like, well, I'm not Catholic. I, didn't, I actually left the Catholic faith, and now I'm evangelical, and so I, I don't know. So this is, I want to give that disclaimer. Another uh, thing that I want to share with you, if you have children, um, this is an incredible book. Um, the Apostles' Creed, uh, text is by uh, Ben Myers, and art is by Natasha Kennedy. Uh, it's an incredible book to go through with your children. Um, just, uh, it, it's illustrated really, really well. Um, and would encourage you, if you have family, uh, to do that, children in your home. Um, creed. Uh, you, you might have had a few things pop up in your mind when you hear that word creed. Maybe a few good Scott Stapp songs that you could bring back to your children today and share the love with them uh, of that generation where uh, you can't actually hear what he's saying, right? You just, you just sing along and bend your words just like he does. Uh, it, 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 you might sing Arms Wide Open. Anybody? Higher. Yeah, there's some good ones. There's some good ones there. Uh, if you're really Christian, though, uh, you might remember this guy named Rich Mullins. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Third Day ruined this song later on, as they do with most songs. Uh, but Rich Mullins, if you're a Third Day fan, I'm sorry, I just, it's not my deal. Um, Rich Mullins was incredible, and he had this um, song called Creed that he put to music and had this incredible song reading out and singing out the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, wh what do you believe? What do you as a follower of Jesus believe? What do you hold on to? That's what we're going to be discussing uh, this morning as we start this series on the Apostles' Creed. I think it's a question that we should all be asking, do I know what I believe? Can I can I proclaim what I believe? Can I, can I uh, with words from my mouth, can I describe what I believe? I think for a lot of people, belief is more, uh, it's more of a feeling than it is something concrete. It's something that we, well, I've experienced and I feel and I know. And so that's, that's, the, that's the truth for me, is it because I've experienced and I feel it and I know it, then it's, then it's the truth. I feel this is right, so it must be right. Many studies now conclude that most Western Christians, uh, we are at an all-time low of knowledge of doctrine and theology and the Word of God, uh, but we have access to more information than ever before. And you think about this, how many Bibles as Western Christians do we have in our homes? Think about it for a moment. You could, I, I could probably count 20 different Bibles that we have in my house alone. 
but we, we don't read them as often. We don't study them as often. We don't know what it's teaching. And so um, you, you combine that with the interesting times in which we are living, which philosophers call the, uh, the, the worldview of expressive individualism. Carl Truman, author, has written extensively on this. And if you have not read uh, The Rise and Fall of the Modern Self or his more approachable book, uh, Strange New World, you need to read it because it is fascinating to look at how the world is structured and how we got to where we are in our day now. Truth is a, a shifting target. There's no absolute truth. They actually say that we live in the post-truth world. Doesn't that sound scary? Now, found, that, that seems like un, unsettling to our hearts when we think like the post-truth world. This is where we see the, the my own truth set sentiment in our culture today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my truth. This is my truth. And if it's my truth, then it must be true because it's what I feel and see and know. You can't change it even with facts and data. There's a, a way that this goes too far. Hitler believed in his heart that Jews were a lesser race. It was his truth. It was his reality. And now six million Jews were murdered because of one man's belief of a lesser race. In our modern world, we see this play out where uh, as ridiculous as it sounds that someone can identify as an animal and some people think that this is the norm. This is the norm. This is true for me because it's what I feel. And we see this slope of expressive individualism and how it can quickly turn into extreme beliefs that are harmful to a healthy society. But if you flip that coin and you say, what about people that do live with that point of view? How do they view the church? People that have this expressive individualism, how they view the church many times is that we are dangerous to society, that we are harmful to the world, that we are out of touch or out of date with reality. That is the the, the overarching theme you hear from many is that uh, the modern church Christians are just out of date. Many have, even in the church world, have caved to this societal pressure. And they they say they do it out of love, and I believe them. I I think they they want to be loving and accepting and caring and all the things. And and I'm not saying that we don't love people and we don't care for people. This is the, the, the chaos of what is the Methodist church right now. That not only do they now accept LGBTQ members, but now they are ordaining LGBTQ uh, ministers out of love and care and respect, but do we know what we believe? Do we know what we hold to? Do we know what we confess, what we, what, we, what we define as followers of Jesus? What are the things that we say, this is who we are? So what does all this have to do with an ancient text called the Apostles' Creed? I would say this, this has everything to do with it. It has everything to do with it. Because the world in which we live in, as we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, is something that pushes back many times on something like an ancient text or an ancient creed. Uh, This word creed, it comes from the Latin word credo. Credo, which simply means belief. Um, uh, It's a confession, a declaration of who we are as followers of Jesus. What you did a moment ago as we stood and we declared this creed has been done since about the second century in many churches throughout the history of the world. In fact, early on, Christians, they they called the creed the belief. Do you know the belief? Or they called it the the rule of faith. It was was something that they lived for. And for many, it was something that they had to even die for, to say that this is who I am and this is what I believe. I'm willing to put my life on the line because I believe it that much. Now, um, I wanna give an important clarification as we dive in this morning is that this this Apostles' Creed was not written by the apostles themselves. Okay, so this was not written by uh, Peter, John, James. This was not written by the apostles, but it was the apostles' teaching for the early church. Tozer says it this way, is that the early Christians, under the fire of persecution, driven from place to place, 
sometimes de deprived of opportunity for careful instruction in the faith, wanted a rule that would sum up all that they must believe to assure their everlasting welfare. Out of this critical need arose the creeds. Of the many, the Apostles' Creed is best known and best loved and has been reverently repeated by the largest number of believers through the centuries. There was this longing of the people that says, I, I, I can't necessarily go to this church because I'm living in this foreign land and, and, and we, don't, we don't even know who, where the Christians are. We don't have somebody to come and teach us and to disciple us in this way. Can you give us some writing of what we are to do or what we are to know? Uh, it is not just religions that hold two creeds. Uh, I'm going to put a picture on the screen this morning of something that was popular during 2020. This is what many call the secular creed. Uh, you might have seen this in a neighbor's yard. Not as many in Montgomery County, but um, you might have seen this in a neighbor's yard. You might have seen this if you're driving through a neighborhood. Um, this is a creed. N notice the wording. It's hard to read a little bit, but uh, in this house, what, what do we do? We believe. They're making a statement, a, a declaration of what they believe. And the secular creed says this, that if you don't hold to, if you hold to any other belief, then you're a bigot. You're hate-filled. You're out of touch with society. And so I ask you again, what do you believe? Do you know what you believe? Let's look at Romans chapter 10 this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I, I read out of the ESV translation, and that's where we're going to be this morning, verses 9 and 10. This is what it says. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Uh, when, when I was growing up in church, um, uh, anybody remember Sunday school? Remember those days? Your parents dragged you out of the house so early, so early. Um, and you'd have the most boring teacher in the, light, in the world trying to keep you awake at 8.30 in the morning at church on the, that Sunday morning. But there were some incredible things that took place in there. One of those things that we had to memorize as a young person was the Romans Road to Salvation. Anybody remember that? A couple of you, yeah? It was this, this idea that you could kind of share the gospel as you shared and read through these scriptures in Romans. This was one of the scriptures that we would hold on to, that... If you confess with your mouth and believe, uh, believe with the, believe, confess with Jesus is Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus raised from the dead, then you'll be saved. This is the ABCs of salvation, so to speak. It's a clear gospel message. But the key word in this passage is believe. You confess with your mouth, but believe in your heart. Uh, a word in the original language, it carries the meaning of firm reliable, trustworthy. It's, a, it's concrete, it's solid. And belief, this, this idea of belief is something that is essential and primary to the Christian faith, which many times is distinctive compared, comparatively to other religions. You think about other religions throughout the world, you could be born into it. You could be raised in it. You can work your way into it. For good works, if you knock on enough doors in your neighborhood, at some point you're going to earn enough work so that you can be a follower of whatever they believe. That is the idea that many live with. This is a hallmark of Christianity um, that you are not born into. You don't work your way into it. There's no single action. You can't discipline your way into it. You can't clean yourself up enough so that you can be accepted into it. It is only by the single word right there, belief in the Son of Jesus that gets us into the kingdom of God. That's it. But this word belief, it's a little weak in the English language because we believe a lot of things. We believe that our politicians are going to tell us everything and they're going to do it what they said that they're going to do. Did you know that the other side is always lying and your side is always right? Isn't that weird how that works? There's some tension in the room. Everybody loves it when I talk about politics. 
We, we believe things like that. We believe that our favorite sports team is finally going to do well this year. <laughs> yeah, this is the year. Hmm. It's not. <laughs> we, we turn belief into wishful hope. Like I, it's almost like I hope that my team does good. But we say the phrase, I believe, I believe that they're going to do good this year. And it's this wishful thinking that we've kind of turned uh, belief into. But when we believe in something like God, the creator of the universe, it is not wishful thinking. It is concrete, it is solid, and it is, it is sure ground for us to stand on. It's not wishful thinking. And this belief leads us to something that's very important. Um, that F.F. Uh, Bruce says it this way, is that believing and confessing are inseparable. When we believe, then we confess. When we confess, when we, th then we believe. There, that, that's why the, the creeds are so important, is that we, as followers of Jesus, we're declaring what we know to be true in our hearts, but we're declaring with our mouth. Let me, let me put it another way. When you have an experience that you really love, and you, you, you like, I'm trying to think of the best example, but you have this experience that you really, really love, the first thing that you do many times is now in 2024, we post about it on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or whatever crazy things are out there. I feel like an old man now because I don't know all the all little details. But we post about it, right? We tell all our friends about it and we're like, hey, you won't believe what I experienced. This is incredible. This is, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I went on this vacation and our kids actually slept when we were there and when we got rest and it was just this incredible experience. We, we start to confess to people what we have experienced and what we believe. Belief and confession are inseparable. And so as we work our way through this, I think a couple things that are important for us to talk through on the Apostles' Creed. Number one is this, is that we live in the age of skepticism. Any skeptics in the room? Come on, it's good for you. Just raise your hand. Everybody already knows it anyways. I, I by nature, am a little skeptical. I, I just give you an example. Um, I'm always skeptical when new technology comes out. I just, I, I don't know why. I just, like when new technology comes out, and I'm like, that's not really needed. <laughs> We're good. I think y'all can, all the tech people, you can be done. We're fine. A uh, few, few, I guess, as of probably last year sometime, I, my car was broken down. I was driving my father-in-law's vehicle, and he drives way nicer vehicles than I drive. And, um, and so I'm driving this vehicle, and one of those things that I was talking about, the technology, is heated steering wheel. I'm like, who needs that? <laughs> Literally, we live in Texas. And one day out of the year, we need a heated steering wheel. This is, this is dumb. Um, it turns out it's pretty amazing. <laughs> when you're driving down the road, and you're like, hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna turn on the uh, massage seat. <laughs> Driving around, right? It's pretty good technology, but I was pretty skeptical of it at first. I was like, nah, you don't need this. This is ridiculous. And uh, one day I'm going to have one. All right. Um, <laughs> there's something in our culture that says newer is always better. Newer is always better. Like, it, whatever the newest thing is, right? I, I joke about this all the time. Uh, I, have a, um, I have an iPhone 13 Pro. I feel like I'm so out of date, Right? <laughs> I'm like, this ancient thing right here. Compare it to the Nokia that I started with as a young person that I wore the, the buttons off from Snake. Anybody else? <laughs> There's something about us that it's like, I, some, newer is better. I've got to get to this. And when something comes from old or from history, there's an automatic pushback. It's like, um, I, I don't know, that's just different. Now, I may lose a lot of church members today, um, but I did not grow up in this area. Y'all know that. Um, the first time I was exposed to the cult of the Aggies. Um, <laughs> where you at? Where you at? It's tradition, right? Guys, cheerle I mean, uh, yell leaders and all the things, right? Y'all want me to stop yet? Like, it's tradition, and some of it I just don't get. Like, I, me and Lindsay went to the, the first SEC game because they were playing the Gators, and our friends surprised us with tickets and did not tell us the tickets were in the alumni section. 
it was quiet at the end of the game. But, you know, it's like we were sitting in the game, and, and I don't know what's going on. And everybody's like, ooh, 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 doing all this stuff. And I was like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, I got these big burly arms around me, and I'm like dragged back and forth. The crowd, like, I have no clue what is happening. (laughs) Have you been to the swamp? No. All right. (laughs) Tradition, right? And there's pushback for me because I didn't grow up around that tradition. And I'm like, hey, this is outdated. You need to change some stuff. That's the kind of mentality that we live with a lot of times. Author Ben Myers says it this way. Is that we assume that the truest thing that we could ever say would be something that we made up ourselves. Is that not scary? And so when we confess a creed like the Apostles' Creed, there is a defiance in it a holy, righteous defiance that I believe in something that's been around for a lot longer than my life or my generation or my family. Uh, There is something about it that is defiant, saying this is who I am. This is who I identify with as a follower of Jesus. And it pushes back against the modern world. C.S. Lewis says it this way, is that every age has its own outlook. It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We have more information at our fingertips than ever before. I've said it already. But we assume that we have more intellect than there's ever been before in the history of the world. I always think about, like, in, in Athens and Lyceum, like, what, these people that would sit around and argue, Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, and, and, and just, they didn't have Google. But like, how did you come up with this stuff? They didn't have all this information that we have. Like, they're just brilliant minds that can, can discuss and have conversations that to this day are still over my head. I have friends that are very bright people, and they recommend books to me, and I'm like, mm-mm. <laughs> because I read them, and I'm like, I don't know what that just said, and I need to read it again. It takes me longer and longer. Some of these old theologians and writers that you, you see in the Christian faith, it's like, man, this, is, this, this feels so far above my intellect. And, 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 and these people were around a lot longer before me. There's an assumption that we um, are smarter than all the other generations. And so we live this mindset that's dangerous to live with it. There's pushback. I, 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 I'm not going to believe that because it's tradition, it's history. Second thing if you're taking notes, you can write this down. We don't hold history on the same level as the Bible, but it does provide insight for our formation. Over the last decade, there's been a really, really big push in the world of deconstruction. How many have seen this on social media or uh, in the church world? Deconstruction. Uh, I want to be gracious in, in how I discuss this because um, it can come across as like, hey, I'm kind of giving the, the spiritual backhand a little bit. And that's not, um, that's not what I want to do. But I, because I, I believe that there is a helpful uh, deconstruction that can happen in our life and in the church. Um, the unhelpful one is throwing everything out and walking away from the faith. It's just saying, you know, I'm done with all of this. Everything is harmful and I'm just gone. Like, I'm leaving, I'm not a part of the church anymore, I'm not a part of the kingdom of God, I'm just, I'm out of the way. Um, Many have built uh, social media followings solely on this premise. Uh, One pastor that I follow said it this way, is that deconstruction without reconstruction is this destruction. Helpful deconstruction is that when we look at what we do and why we do it, and are we doing something that's of the Bible and of Scripture, or is it just tradition, and we've elevated it to the level of the Bible? Does that make sense? Where we, we sometimes take tradition. I mean, you think about 30, 40 years ago, we would have never had padded chairs in a church. It would have been a pew. Why would you ever put a chair in here? Think about, um, there was a church in South Houston, had a new pastor come in. They, they built a new building. They came from a, one of the denominations where they had the altar at the front where you kneel, um, and they didn't take the altar from the previous church and put it into the new church, and 
the members were, they were ready to cast the pastor out. Like angry, volatile, why? Because their grandmother had knelt at that altar, right? That, like there's a tradition side to things that we can say, I'm gonna hold this as truth of scripture. So we gotta be careful not to take things of tradition and hold it on the same level as scripture. But it is helpful to our formation to see what the early church held on to. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is before us. A great cloud of witnesses are the thousands and thousands of followers of Jesus, the way of Jesus, that have gone before us, that have lived a life, that have now passed on, are now spending eternity with the creator of the universe. Those are the great cloud of witnesses. And so when we live with this belief and we, we're saying that we're a part of something much bigger than ourselves. Now, um, last, not last week, the week before, I was in South Georgia at a pastor's counseling retreat. Um, and if you've ever done like therapy work, um, it's the easiest thing you'll ever do in your life. That's a joke, because it's hard. And you sit in this room of pastors and you start talking about all the things that you've experienced or life or traumas and all the things, and you're just like, man, is there anybody in this life that goes through unscathed? No. We're all broken people kneeling at the throne of God, begging for mercy, a beggar at the table. Like, we, we understand that, but I had an incredible week. And then a Friday afternoon, I had a few hours to spend with my family, who still live in Jacksonville, Florida. And, uh, and one of the things that I told my dad I wanted to do, I said, I, I want to go to Grandpa's church building, and I, wanted, I just want to be there for a moment. And uh, for those who don't know, my grandfather, my dad's in ministry. My grandfather was in ministry. He planted a church years ago uh, in the late 80s grew the church, and the building's still there. It's owned by, um, it's owned by another church, and they're meeting in there. And, and so I got to go into, the, go into this church building that was where I grew up as a young person. It was built in the early 90s, this big, large uh, facility. And I went to, the, I went to the, the second pew where I used to sit with my grandmother, my little grandma who was like as tall as she was wide, couldn't touch the floor, little Pentecostal lady with the beehive. Y'all know those? Like, you leave, leave, leave the house on Sunday morning, and everybody smells like Aquanet. <laughs> so I go, in the, go into this auditorium, and I sit, and I, I j just had this moment of like, man, I'm not who I am just because, just because of, uh, you know, all the things that I've gone in school for or what my passions are. No, I, I am who I am because I identify with something much bigger than myself. I identify with the, the capital C church, even people that I disagree with, that, that I, I, I'm a part of this family that's very diverse, diverse in, in thought, diverse in belief, diverse in race, diverse in uh, socioeconomical ways. Like there, there's so much diversity in the kingdom of God. And we say all of that, when we say that we are a part of the kingdom of God and we confess this creed, what we're saying is that is us. I remember, it didn't seem long ago that people would get really upset if Jesus was black. And they're like, Jesus wasn't black. He was blonde hair and blue eyed. I'm like, um, have you been to the Middle East? No, didn't think so. We, we have all these assumptions that we walk in with and we're like, it's gotta be this way and that way because it was on the wall at my grandma's house and he used to look down on me and make sure I wasn't sinning. We're confessing we're a part of something bigger, a great cloud of witnesses. Um, there was a, there's something I am thankful that got deconstructed. I'm going to talk about this, this creed uh, in the way of baptism. All right, stay with me. Um, to be baptized in the early church, you would have to recite this creed as you were being baptized. Um, and here's what I'm thankful changed. In the early church, you would have been baptized naked. That's weird for everybody. <laughs> and I am thankful to the Lord God Almighty 
that we don't do that anymore. But, but they would literally strip their clothes off as to say, like, I am stripping off the old, I'm going into the water, and I am coming out and, and being put clothed with the newness of Christ. They would, after they were uh, take their clothes off, they would anoint them with oil, and they would make their way into the water. They would dunk them three different times. Do you believe in the Father? They would repeat, I believe, but dunk them. Second question, do you believe in Jesus, the Son of God, born of Mary? I believe. Dunk them again. Third question, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the resurrection of the flesh? I believe. Dunk the third time. After they were baptized, they would be anointed with oil again. They would put on white clothes, white robes, and they would be ushered into the, into the, to the family of God, the, the congregation of, of the people of God, and able to take communion with the saints at that point. Just you think about what a beautiful picture that is. It's a beautiful picture of being baptized. Uh, when you're baptized, that you're saying, I, I, I identify with all of these things. I'm taking off the old and I'm putting on the new, and now I'm accepted into the family of God, and I can commune with the saints. It was a confession of who they were and what they believed. And somewhere along the line, we've taken creeds and we've put them on the background or on the back burner, so much so that many in the 20th century, maybe like 15, 20 years ago, people would say things like this and they would be very defiant about it. No creed but Christ. And they would, they would kind of bang the podium, so to speak, almost to pit one another, uh, pit, pit the other, pit, pit them against each other, excuse me. But I can think of no greater confession of Christ than to stand together as a church family and repeat the words that we just stay, we, we, we read together that I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe that he's coming back again. History is in everything, but it can help us in our formation. And then the third thing, and Al, you can come. We must hold to the essentials of the Christian faith. We must hold to the essentials of the Christian faith. In the world of theology um, and doctrine, uh, Mark Driscoll I know that's like a bad word now, um, but Mark Driscoll, who I used to love and had his failure and all the things, right? So I'm not, not here to judge, but he had something that was very helpful. And he called them open-handed and closed-handed issues. And in the world of doctrine and theology, you have things that are open-handed, meaning this is that we, these are things that we can disagree on and we can work together, we can serve together, we're a part of the kingdom, but there are things that are closed-handed issues that you cannot mess with or adjust or say, hey, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to believe that Jesus was actually the son. I'm just going to believe that he was just a prophet. That's a close-handed issue. And so open-handed, close-handed. And let me give you an example of some open-handed issues. Women in ministry. I'm going to sit there for a moment because there are many that would make that a close-handed issue. And they would shout from the mountaintops that you are uh, a heretic because you have a woman on the stage. To me, it's an it's a open-handed issue. It's an open-handed issue. We don't have to make a mountain out of the molehill, so to speak, in that way. Another one, uh, our view of God's sovereignty. It's an open-handed issue. In the sense of this, like how, how it plays out in our world. We, we trust that God is sovereign. He's holding all things together. He's reigning and he's ruling. But how that takes place, there's a lot of... A lot of uh, Distinction between the different camps. Another one, views of creation. How creation happened. I'm talking timing-wise. I'm not saying like whether like Big Bang or Jesus like, or God. Like I'm saying like how God created the world. There's differing views and that's an open-handed issue. Gifts of the Spirit. I have great friends that are cessationists that would say, God doesn't speak anywhere outside of his word anymore. If you have a vision or a dream, it's just, it's just by chance, it's by happenstance. Uh, the, the gifts of the spirit are ceased today. That's what they would say. And I would say, I disagree with that. I think done in order and structure and in community with one another, the gifts of the spirit are a, are a beautiful, beautiful gift to the church. But again, it's, it's a secondary issue. But what happens is many like to take these and make them primary issues. But I would caution us, hold the secondary issues with open hands. But this is why the creed is important, as it takes the closed-handed issues and say, this 
is the foundation of what we believe. This is it. I believe in God our Father. I believe the creator of the universe. I believe in the, the Son who was born of the Virgin Mary. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in his church. It's the essentials. And so when we live with a creed like this, we declare a creed like this. What it does, first and foremost, this, this series is not going to be a way for you to find out all the doctrines so you can go argue with your friends that are not believers or that you disagree with. You know, one of my, my least favorite things about Bible college was is people would come to the cafe and it was like they were just looking for somebody to argue with all the time. Like, why do you, you enjoy this? And what I found was this, is they would sit there and argue for hours, hours, like passionate, like this is the way. I, I'm right, and you're wrong. And they would get up after the ta- off, at, from the table after a couple hours and no one changed their mind and they just went back to about, about their lives. Like, what are we doing? This is not for you to go argue with friends or people you disagree with, but this is to say, this is who we are as a church and what we believe. But one of the things and benefits that it does is it takes our eyes off of ourselves and it puts our eyes on the creator of the universe and say, listen, I may have different feelings, I may have different experiences, but when I say that I'm a part of the Apostles' Creed, that I'm a part of the church, I'm putting my focus and my gaze and my attention on him and him alone. And that is, there's a defiance in that as well, because in a world that would say, focus so much only on yourselves and what you have and what you have going on, for us to turn the attention and say, you know what? What I'm experiencing, what I think, and what, I, what I'm wrestling with is secondary to what I know to be true about God. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning.